Hello, hello, hello. Uh, this hello, is, everyone. Hello, this is uh, Carrie and my co-host, Brad. Uh, you've joined us for our Cars and Coffee with Kenny Brown. And we're happy to have you here and happy Father's Day weekend for all those fathers out there. We really appreciate you being here this weekend. We have an extra special guest. And typically what uh, Brad and I are trying to do is play a video from Kenny teaching us some tech. Um, but uh, Wes has so much to share with us today. We're not, we're going to eliminate that for today, and what, but we'll carry for, forward with it next week. So what we're going to do here is we'll introduce Mr. Dunkel on our screen. Hey, Wes. Hello. How are you? Doing well. Good. I've got my coffee cup here. <laughs> That's aspirational. Excellent. I don't have one yet. <laughs> That's great. So what we're going to do is, um, Wes, why don't you give us a little background on yourself? Tell us a little bit about where you started in the automotive industry. Sure. Um, actually, that's a really good question. I kind of, actually, if we want to, um, we can, I, I kind of go into that a little bit on my slideshow. So if um, okay. we can, I'm joining you from my happy place, the garage. Um, so, um, but yeah, if uh, if we want to just go ahead and uh, I can show you share my screen and we can go through the slideshow and I'll kind of talk about that a little bit. Okay. I have visuals to go along with the yapping, so okay. Yeah, that but, uh, hopefully, good. and also we'll uh, we'll answer some questions as well because I'm sure you probably have a lot of questions as we go through, and I love to uh, share what I've learned and what mistakes I've made and how I've okay. corrected those. So anyway, Wes is going to be he is the author of there's a shadow on here how to build and modify there. <laughs> I'll Let's let you hold it up, Wes. I'll move the screen to you. Okay. Um, we'll we'll talk about this book too. Yeah, so. Yeah, we'll but, talk about this Wes, book as well, so. Yeah, Wes is first gonna share some tech information, a little bit about him, and then uh, we'll open for a Q and A, and uh, we'll go from there. So Wes, why don't you take it away, share your screen. Will do, okay. Elevator music should be playing at the moment. Well, Please hello, hold. Fred. Fred was here yesterday, Fred Francher, and he picked up his car. He had a full Kenny Brown suspension done on his uh, Shelby GT, and uh, he's happy with that. Joe Johnson, good to see you. Joe, I hear you uh, were in a little contusion with your truck and didn't get to the track. I'm so sorry about that. Brad, uh, Brian West, good to see that you're here. And I forgot your name from Niagara. You're on every week, but you are always there. Thank you. For some reason, your name's not showing up on our screen. So Bob Jones, good to see you there. And we have, I think it's Rory from Maple Ridge, British Columbia. So welcome everybody. Wes, if you're ready to share your screen, I will share it and we'll get on with the presentation. Again, if you're just joining in, this is Wes Dunkel. And he is going to share a little bit and about how to build and modify your S197, uh, specifically the 11 to 14s. Here you yep. go, Wes. Great. Uh, so is the screen being shared at the moment? Yes, it is. Great. So yeah, there's um, just, uh, like I said, um, my name's Wes Dunkel. Um, I've uh, currently, I'm a professional photographer. Uh, I guess you could say I'm a book author because I wrote a book now. Um, but I am for sure a Mustang nerd. Um, so just this just a little bit about the photography side um these are you know four four gts at sebring uh 2019 i believe um there's a, one of the things i do some work for ford and a lot of times it's a well we've uh, we're gonna have all these cars together uh they, they let me know maybe a day or two in advance and they say you got 15 minutes to get it done <laughs> so because race weekends are really busy so it's one of those uh you do what you bet what you can um in the time frame that you have and um, it's kind of one of those things where it's 80 percent preparation 20 percent luck maybe vice versa but anyway so this is an example somebody took this photo i guess from the media center across the way of this photo shoot going on and then it was on social media i thought well i need to save that but then hit this photo is the final result um use some flashes and stuff like that but anyway on this slide also besides four beautiful four gts is uh, my contact information so might want to take a screenshot or get your um, phone out, um, take a picture of that stuff if you want to contact me. Um, email address there is west at westdunkel.com. Uh, my website, which also has copies of the book, shameless plug. Um, and then also I have a YouTube channel uh, called Fix Body Mustangs. Not That's not a typo uh, because I'm always fixing on them 
it's a fixed body Mustang, not a Fox body. So um, quite a few uh, videos uh, on that YouTube, uh, including a lot of Kenny Brown stuff, because um, I've been have had the pleasure of installing a lot of Kenny Brown things over the over the years and have been more and more impressed with the quality and fitment and performance of those products um, as the years go on and they keep getting better and better. So um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm always wrenching on stuff. Uh, I always, my Mustangs are in my garage in various states of undress all the time. So that's pretty typical. But uh, this is 1995. Um, I wanted a car. I, I wasn't looking for a Mustang, but I graduated high school and I wanted a, wanted a car with a V8, uh, preferably a manual transmission. Well, just about a mile from my house, a guy was selling this 85 Mustang for 1500 bucks, and it was probably not worth that. But I learned a lot from this car. Um, and if you, one thing you can look at is, at the time, look at it. This car was only 10 years old. I mean, this is 1995, and look at how rough that car is, rust and everything. So, cars of quality, you know, rust-wise and corrosion protection and everything have come a long way. Now, this car was wrecked probably a couple times before I bought it, so that doesn't help. But the rust issues, you know, that kind of stuff. Only 10 years old. I mean, that's something. So anyway, uh, that's what Midwestern winters will do to a car, though. Um, this is kind of typical then. <laughs> Always had the car apart. Uh, here we're donating the transmission to another car. Um, always working in the garage. If I had a garage, great, but I mean, driveway, whatever, because you got to do what you got to do. Um, and then I bought this one um, shortly thereafter, um, actually from the same guy, but uh, this is another 85. And this one kind of became my partner in crime um, when I was in college and really launched my interest in working on Mustangs and working on cars in general. Um, I, my dad didn't really do it. I mean, he tinkered a little bit. He'd change his own oil, do little things like that. But I basically learned by doing um, on, the, on the car mechanic side. I mean, I just learned by making mistakes and figuring it out and, um, you know, watching what other people do. And at the time, you know, 1995, 96, 97, the Internet had just started. And so that was a great place for me to find a lot of information and find a community of people to do it. Um, look, there's a theme here, cars and pieces on, out in the open. But um, here, I guess I'm taking the K member and stuff, and I was going to put it in a different car. Um, you could see my high-tech engine uh, support device there, a 4x4 with some chains, which does work quite well. Uh, that one donated suspension to this one, which is a car I got for free. Um, probably that was too much as well. But um, this is a 83 Mustang Coupe that um, I got. It was a V6 automatic car that somebody gave to me and said, here, you need a Fox. And so I thought, okay, well, I need another one. And I wanted to build one. So what I ended up doing is building it into that, which was at the time um, I had some, um, I had a full-time job. I wasn't real crazy about the full-time job, um, but I wanted to, I thought, you know, I, I really want to build cars. Uh, at the time, I wanted to build cars for a living, you know, race prep cars, build cars and stuff. So I thought, you know, I really want to do this. And so this became, I, I was going to be my rolling business card uh, for that endeavor. Um, uh, carbon fiber front fenders had made, I mean, exhaust through the body, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but it was, you know, I wanted to have a gutted road legal uh, track card. So that's what I built it into. Um, well, I did everything myself except for the the paint and the body. Uh, so, um, but um, this kind of at the time though, um, by the time the car was finished, which took me several years to finish it, um, I started to get into photography. And so that kind of derailed that plan. But here's another Fox that I've had recently changing the heater core. There's another trend here. It's out in the driveway working on it. So uh, we went and um, this is a S197 that I did most recently. This is the one for the book, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but this is kind of showing a lot of my photography work here, too. This is an 03 Cobra that I currently have as well. This is my Desert Island car. Um, if I had all the money in the world, I wouldn't buy a Ferrari, wouldn't buy Ford GT. I'd buy it. I'd have this car. This is my, my car. And then recently, uh, I picked up an 86 Celine, which Kenny has had, obviously, a lot of history in, you know, developing um, these cars and making them into what they were for Celine in, in 1987 and beyond. So 86s had disc, I mean, had uh, drum brakes and, you know, not a lot of the suspension and handling parts that the later models did um, because of things they learned racing, uh, you know, racing these cars in particular and the shortcomings, addressing the shortcomings for, uh, for racing them. 
Uh, when I was in college, um, I went to college though more for uh, actually an art degree. Um, I was gonna, I wanted to be an industrial designer where it's just like product design, but of course I had a passion for cars and I was constantly drawing cars and I had always ideas about cars. So um, that basically uh, I realized, quickly realized that I had, I was more interested in working on my car than actually sipping coffee and thinking about design. So um, here we're just doing a water pump replacement at a buddy's place um, at college. And I went to University of Wisconsin Stout, uh, which is a state school about um, about an hour, uh, about an hour, um, into Wisconsin from Minnesota. So like, um, from the twin cities, uh, you know, a Minneapolis about an hour, uh, an hour East. So we had bad winters and, um, we, you know, you, you, when you have weather that's conducive enough to, uh, drink beer and change a water pump, you do it and you enjoy it. But I kind of always had a, I was always particular, um, I, especially about sound. And so here I'm actually recording uh, different muffler combinations that I had on that car. Um, and this is probably over winter break, probably in January sometime uh, in Wisconsin. So not the, not the most uh, hospitable situation, but it worked. Um, I was, this is something I kind of designed as a senior project which were some control arms that had an adjustable sway bar amount. Um, a lot of it was just figuring it out. Um, far as where even to find materials. I think I even used tubing that was exhaust tubing for the, you know, for the, um, where the, the bushing, um, the, the bushing sleeves, which would not be advisable. Um, but I didn't know at the time, I didn't know there was such a thing as metal supply places. I just took what I could find, uh, what I could find, but, uh, I eventually learned how to do it differently. So, um, this, uh, is some of you may recognize this place. So this is, um, kind of brings us to, uh, to the family here as well, but um, in 1999, I um, wanted to do an internship and I was going to school and um, usually, you know, you kind of do an internship, you try to do an internship during the summer, especially when you're closing in on graduation. So I, con I went through a Muscle Mustangs magazine, flipped through the whole thing and, con and sent emails and letters um, to all the advertisers, or advertisers in the magazines because that's where I wanted to do an internship. I didn't want to do an internship, you know, at the placement office at school because they were boring places. They were places that made... Uh, who don't, you know, well, it's Wisconsin. So there's a lot of food processing stuff or injection molding and uh, cheese making. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. I wanted to work on cars. I wanted to learn how to do it. So um, uh, HP Motorsport was one of the only places, like one of two, I think. I sent probably 30 emails and 40 emails, proposals to people. And they were one of the only people that called me back and they were, they said, yeah, we'd like to have you come out. I thought, great, let's do it. Uh, I remember at the time it was, uh, I thought it was a lot of money at the time. It was like 450 bucks a week to pay me. I thought some internships aren't paid. So this sounds great. This is where I met Paul Brown, uh, Kenny's son. And um, this is, there's, well, Paul was a diehard workaholic. Um, and I, I think it kind of runs in the family. But um, he was either on the phone, he was on the phone all day talking to customers um, at HP Motorsport. Um, at night, he'd be working on the race car. Um, and since I was in college uh, and I was in Omaha, Nebraska with them for a summer, I really had nothing else to do, which suited Paul just fine because that meant that we could work on stuff into the evening all the time, uh, including this. This is a car that um, we um, we put together. Um, it was a wide body Celine. It was based on actually the chassis is a uh, uh, like a pre-production um, Mustang from Ford. It was called, uh, I think they didn't have Vins for them and this one was called Muffin. So that's why this race car became, uh, was named Muffin. But, um, this is a car that we built, um, in the summer of 1999, um, and for a world challenge. And, uh, here's me with that car. So, um, a lot of times, you know, you do what you can to get it done. Uh, so here's Paul and Kenny actually, uh, in, um, 2009, uh, for a uh, Mustang challenge. Now, by 2009, 10 years later, I had um, had kids, family, started doing uh, racing photography professionally. And um, so I met Kenny uh, while doing, um, I was the series photographer for the Mustang Challenge uh, in 2009 and 2010. And so I met Kenny there. Obviously, I knew Paul for you know many years and we were good friends and hung out together. Um, but uh, I hadn't really known Kenny that much, but I got to know him uh, through his work with the Mustang Challenge. Um, and it was definitely a lot of the same traits, you know, being, you know, he was a constant learner, uh, which I appreciate because I loved school. I really did like school. I liked learning. 
I didn't necessarily like learning at eight o'clock in the morning on a Friday morning, but I liked learning uh, new things. Um, and Kenny had kind of that uh, that passion as well. Uh, you know, obviously sharing information of what he learned. Um, you know, he with his cars and coffees. You know, I've really appreciated those in over the past couple of years. Just you know, sharing what you learn and being humble about it is all name of the game. So, um, yeah, this is some Mustang Challenge stuff. I did. You know, the, uh, was the photographer for Mustang Challenge. Um, here's one of the Speedworks cars that uh, Kenny uh, engineered. I believe that. Uh, that looks like Paul driving. Um, I think he drove the 44 car. So he, Paul, um, just real quick, Paul drove uh, one of the Mustang Challenge cars at Barber. Um, I'm not exactly sure. They must have had a, they might have had an open seat. Um, I'm, maybe, I'm not sure how that the, the, the situation all worked out, but there was an availability and Paul and, you know, and Paul and Ken were, uh, were working together a little bit at that time. So, um, you know, Paul came out and drove the Mustang Challenge car. It was kind of interesting up to that point. Um, not to get in the weeds, but one of the things that surprised Paul about the Mustang Challenge car was that um, he thought, you know, setup wasn't all that big of a deal. He'll just drive around anything. And he realized that the Mustang Challenge car was actually very sensitive to setup. And if it wasn't set up right, you were going to be slow no matter how fat, how hard you drove it or how much you drove, tried to drive around any issues. So, yeah, it was a bit of a I think it was a bit of a humbling experience for Paul when he learned, you know, that, look, I mean, my, my driving ability will only take me so far. Car setup actually matters. And so that's where Kenny and Paul actually worked on um, some setups during the race, because I think there was something that happened during the race. And Paul was like, a, was, you know, kind of hanging around the back. He's like, what am I doing? Why don't we just set up the car and try some different setups? And the setups that they actually developed, um, I believe, during that race actually were kind of the baselines that they used for the rest of the season. So um, the Mustang challenge work that I did, um, I met Mickey Mattis from Ford and he really liked my work. And so fortunately that turned into other work with Ford, including um, Daytona prototypes. Uh, they started to do the Daytona prototype uh, as a way to prove out the engine for the Ford GT. Um, so I uh, got to do work actually for Ford um, during that Daytona prototype era, um, which was really, really good. Um, and then that there's Joey Hand at Daytona. I think they won that year. Um, but that work, um, or maybe it's the O2 car that won that year. Okay. Yeah, that's Tony Kanaan driving there as well. So they use those photos for posters and things like that. But that work, uh, the, the Daytona prototype work obviously turned into the Ford GT. Uh, and that was a really neat project to work on as well. Um, got to do it from, you know, the first time that Ganassi pulled a you know, car out of the trailer at Daytona right after, um, right after Petit Le Mans in um, November of, uh, I guess that'd be 2015. So um, anyway, got to do the uh, uh, 4GT stuff uh, in IMSA. Um, so that was cool. A colleague of mine, Bob Chapman, and I did all that work for Ford um, through those four years of the program, 2016 to 2019. And that work, of course, leads to other cool work that I get to do for Ford, including uh, the new next gen, you know, uh, NASCAR. Um, got to do that. Um, and now the Ford GT, uh, the Mustang GT4 is a great project that I get to do some work with Ford on as well. But especially with the teams, uh, this is PF Racing. And uh, this was from Daytona this year where they had three. Um, uh, they had three Mustangs that they were running. Um, and then uh, Core had a couple. Anyway, so but Mustang GT4, that's uh, a nice piece of kit anyway. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a minute if you have any GT4 questions, because I just did a deep technical dive for those. Uh, that's going to be out in Mustang Home Magazine. Well, let's talk about the book. So um, this is, uh, it turned out, um, this publisher reached out to me, and I did a lot of technical work, uh, technical writing and stuff for different magazines over the years as well. And they reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to write a book on S197 Mustangs? And I thought, sure, I'll try that out. That was uh, in January of 2020, which turned out to be a good project to work on for the year of 2020. Kept me busy. Um, so this is a book about uh, 2011 to 14 Mustangs and modifying those. Um, the information in the book, though, however, still applies toward um, uh, basically 2005 to 2014. The suspension stuff, chassis stuff, all that. The only reason it's 2011 to 14 is um, because the Coyote engine is specific in those cars. And they, all the engine stuff is just for obviously for coyotes. So how can I get one? Operators are standing by, but you can get uh, an autographed copy um, at my website or uh, at the, on the Kenny Brown website, um, or you can just get a copy, you know, that doesn't have an autograph um, on, from Amazon or your favorite bookstore. So I think Barnes and Noble will either have them or order them. 
um, but you can do it that way as well. But the book um, really centers around uh, 2014, I mean, a, a 20, well, this is a 2012 Mustang that I bought, but it was completely stock. Um, these cars are actually in a good place right now, uh, you know, uh, value-wise. I mean, you can get one mid-teens. Uh, this one I bought for 17, but you can get one for mid-teens, a good car, no accident, that kind of stuff. Um, the early three valve, you know, 4.6 liter three valve powered cars are probably, uh, you know, $5,000 cheaper. You know, you can get those around 10, a good one around 10 to 12, you know. Um, so all those, an S197 is a really, really nice project car. Um, they're easy to work on. They are, um, everything is, you know, the, the, all the hose connections are click hose connections. I mean, it's, there's no hose clamps to monkey with. It's really, they're really nice. Uh, all the fasteners have little flags on the back. So if you are, uh, taking a nut off or a bolt off, you won't have to hold the other side with a wrench. It's got a flag on it. I mean, it's really easy. They made it easy to assemble. Uh, and of course it makes it easy to disassemble. So, um, this car had, uh, ended up with the Edelbrock supercharger that we did for the book. Um, can't remember exactly how much power it made up. I think I have a dynograph in here, but, um, we did, we put a, a Tremec, uh, Magnum transmission in it, um, a bunch of other stuff, but, um, yeah, so this is where we started, um, where we ended. So it started, this is on a Mustang dyno, but we started at, uh, 339, uh, horsepower to the wheels and then ended up with 537 at the wheels. And that's with the stage one, uh, or no, the stage two Edelbrock um, kit on it. So um, really good power though. I mean, it's, uh, these cars are responsive uh, for, for modifications. You know, you're not, it's not like the old, you know, uh, push rod days where you're gonna pick up big gains by putting on an air filter or anything like that. I mean, it's, they're, they're incremental, but they, but they are, they are significant so over time you can make you know with by adding a bunch of different things you can make good power yeah we had um so headers are helpful um there's the magnum transmission um really good um you know suspension stuff I, kenny brown stuff we I put that in um the rear grip kit and i have to say and i mean this is not a this is not a plug i mean this is serious it fit perfectly i was extremely impressed with how well Usually you're thinking, you know, holes don't line up. I mean, working on Fox bodies and SN95s, you know, stuff's not really going to line up anyway. But I mean, usually the holes are, you know, you kind of have to wiggle a bolt to get it in. This, I mean, this stuff just bolted in like it was factory stuff. The bolt, all the bolt holes lined up. I mean, it was super nice. And another thing I learned that was really interesting, um, spherical rod ends, you think they're going to be a little noisy or something like that. Not rattly, but transmit a little bit, bit of noise into the cabin. I could not tell the difference between the rubber bushings and this from an NVH standpoint. Um, so, you know, one thing to think about is it's easy to make a car fast. Um, it's hard to make a car better. So um, this kind of stuff, maybe I'll back up here, but if this suspension stuff, sure, it makes it faster, but it makes the car better. And you're not going to have NVH penalties, any of that stuff. I mean, it was phenomenal. I was really impressed with it. So uh, braking wise too, uh, put GT500 brakes on it. Um, these brakes are also really incredible. So um, had a Kenny Brown brake duct uh, on the brake ducts on there as well. And also the street and performance coilovers actually uh, came from H&R and those were, that was a really nice setup as well. Um, spring rates seemed really good for road driving um, and it made the car obviously a lot more responsive um, and you can adjust the ride height as well, which is which is nice. And it bolted in uh, just like stock. So in the book, we kind of talk about a lot of things. Um, and I try to cover a lot of theory, you know, not only what to do, but why, why it works. Um, so here we talk about things, basic stuff like tire temperatures and how to, you know, how alignment affects tire temperatures. Um, tires are a huge, uh, obviously, uh, huge performance factor. So, I mean, having a good 200 tread wire tire is going to make the car feel and perform a whole lot different. Uh, we talk about, you know, suspension stuff. So not only, you know, what, but why, I mean, uh, weight transfer, um, sp you know, springs and shocks and all that stuff and how the center of gravity relates to, to weight transfer and how spring rates relate to weight transfer. Um, so I have, you know, some different spring options in here listed, um, damper rates and how, you know, how dampers affect and even damper construction you know, monotubes versus twin tubes, what's the difference and why, um, sway bars. So, you know, that's another thing that's a big, uh, tuning tool. Um, and then suspension geometry. So, you know, um, roll centers and how they affect ride and handling. Um, and 
um, instant center you for anti dive and anti squat um, geometry as well. And so all that stuff actually incidentally is uh, adjusted and tweaked with uh, with Kenny's geometry. So um, that's uh, it's all related. So that's where we kind of talk about that here. You know, and this one even has uh, some information about the new K link, which is a really phenomenal suspension design. Uh, revolutionary as far as adapting that type of uh, linkage to an S197 Mustang, and it is a complete bolt-in, which is um, extremely impressive. Uh, but we also cover other stuff, Watts Link or Panhard Bar as well, and what's the difference between them and why one may be desirable or for, you know, what you're doing versus others and why the design, you know, the, the drawbacks and advantages of each design. Um, more uh, suspension stuff, so especially with, uh, um, with the rear grip kit, um, um, and then also a big, big thing that was, uh, that we did was the, uh, Magnum transmission. So, um, the M, uh, MTA 82 transmission in this, um, in the S197 Mustangs is kind of has a bad rap, um, mostly because of the shifter design, not necessarily because the transmission's weak. I mean, it's not, it's not the strongest thing around, but it's mostly just the shifter design where it's, uh, attached partly to the, um, transmission and partly to the body. And then when the two are, when the engine's under load, the engine moves around because it's on rubber mounts, um, which is a good thing, but it moves around. And so when it moves around, but the shifter is partly attached to the body that's not moving, um, then uh, you get missed shifts and things like that. Anyway, one way to fix all that in one fell swoop is with a Magnum transmission. And one thing also we talk about is gear ratio spread. So I have some soft tooth diagrams on the right hand side that talk about um, gear ratios. And one of the, my other complaints about the MT82 was that when you're driving on a uh, fourth gear, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, if you're driving around in fifth gear, which is one to one, um, sixth gear is the only overdrive. And it's a big RPM drop when you go from uh, fifth, which is one to one to sixth. And um, with 373 gears, which is what the car that I had uh, came with factory, we had a factory 373 gear car, and I'd be driving around and um, you, I kind of felt myself you know, around 40 miles an hour, 45, you're constantly going between, you're hunting between fifth and sixth, but six was too tall and fifth was too short. So the Magnum transmission has a much uh, more, uh, is a much more drivable gear ratio spread. You can see with the sawtooth diagrams there on the right, um, fourth is one-to-one -one, and fifth and sixth are both overdrive. So that RPM drop is a split between fifth and sixth, which um, I liked a lot better. Uh, get into the weeds there, I guess, but also talked about the details of making an, a Magnum uh, fit in an S197, which a lot of people kind of, a lot of you know, people think it's just a bolt-in, but it's kind of not to get it to work um, as far as with the speed sensor, but also the reverse lockout, but you can with a, a, a module you can get from a modern driveline. I think Bowler makes it as well. Um, and I'd show to actually how to hook it up. And also there's some tuning things that you need to do in the tune. Uh, because to get cruise control to work properly as well, you have to actually tell the PCM what the gear ratios are, and they're going to be different than the MT82. So we talk about that as well. Um, just, you know, obviously a lot of how-to stuff, how to put in headers, and I even talk about what extensions and tools you need to reach some of the tricky bolts, uh, especially the starter. I love Ford, for, but the way they mount the starter to the bell housing is frustrating in every single Mustang. Foxes, SN95s. S197s on with coyotes. I'm not sure. I don't know why they mount the starter that way. The bolts that are hard to reach. Uh, they should be watching what GM and Chrysler does, and I'm sure there's a reason, but I don't know what that reason is, and it's frustrating. Anyway, tuning wise, too, we talk about that in the book. Um, use HP Tuner software, which I think you had uh, Tony the Tuner on uh, Cars and Coffee at least once. Um, HP Tuner software is really nice software. Um, it's pretty intuitive. Um, you have to kind of know some things, but cover that in the book. And there's some specific things that you can do that are pretty straightforward. Um, just if you're patient and uh, use a little bit of logic. Um, and I cover things like a uh, really common thing would be like putting on uh, so uh, mass airflow sensor tuning. So if you put on a larger tube, but you stick the sensor in there, this the mass airflow sensor is going to need to be retuned if it's beyond a certain diameter window. And so, um, but you can tune your mass airflow sensor using the HP tuner software and the procedure I outlined in the book. Um, Cooling. We did a big cooling upgrade for uh, for this Mustang. It was not later track pack cars had oil coolers. This one did not. Um, track pack didn't, I guess, exist in 2012. Um, so uh, this we you know upgrade the cooling on it. Um, supercharger install the supercharger. Show step by step on how to do all that. Um, yeah, here's some more tuning stuff with uh, HP Tuner software. Um, 
we put on a Cobra Jet uh, intake. We did a naturally aspirated combination of Cobra Jet intake and twin 65 millimeter, or is it 62 millimeter throttle body? I can't remember offhand. But anyway, um, that was actually a really good combination. Uh, more than 400 uh, wheel horsepower, depending on the dyno that you're on. So that's also a really good combination. We talk about all that and how to tune that, um, what's required. Um, obviously, it helps if you have uh, someone to kind of do a little bit of um, road drivability tuning, let's just say. Um, it helps to have somebody to hold the computer like a kid. Just make sure they wear their seatbelt. Um, so that's pretty much the book. I mean, uh, did all the stuff for the book um, myself, um, mostly solo, except for lifting the supercharger. I had my neighbor come over and help me put the super, supercharger uh, on the motor. But all of it I did by myself in my driveway, in my garage, on jack stands. And you can do all of that uh, with these cars. And so super impressed with the S197 Mustang, easy to work on. Um, and you, with just a little bit of tools and patience, and if you pay attention, you can do all this work yourself. Um, Kenny Brown suspension stuff goes on pretty easy in an afternoon. Even the fr uh, front, changing the front cross member and the K member stuff, because there's no power steering hydraulic lines to work with, it's actually, the job is a pleasure. And the cars, I mean, as long as you, uh, uh, well, modern corrosion protection means that um, you don't necessarily have to, you're not going to be worrying about uh, rusty, crusty spindles or fasteners and all that kind of stuff. That's usually pretty, It's they've kind of got that figured out. So I wanted to just kind of touch on a few photography things real quick before we open up to questions. Um, so yeah, obviously everybody loves Ford GT stuff. Um, this is just, you know, guys working on the Ford GT, uh, which is cool. Um, we did testing at uh, several different places and they were just trying to figure out the car at the time. This is a, a Homestead, a Homestead Speedway. So um, working on cars, that just kind of some cool. This will, I think the Ford GT is, will be a highlight of my photography career as far as being able to do this for Ford. It was a privilege and a pleasure to work with all these people. Um, you know, they were, uh, everyone was pulling in the same direction. Ganassi does an excellent job of um, hiring good people and having the right people and letting them do their jobs. And um, Ford's marketing people were that had that same kind of philosophy with uh, Bob Chapman and I. I mean, it was basically we very rarely had anything that we any, I mean, it was just like show up and do your thing, which uh, I greatly appreciate that. Oh, this is interesting. Um, winning at Le Mans. So the, this is what, 1966. And this is the big glass house back in 1966, a photo of that. And after Ford won Le Mans, which unfortunately I didn't get to go. Um, that was a different group of uh, marketing people that got to go, including photographers. But regardless, when they came back, we wanted they wanted to do something similar. So they said, we're going to um, block off the windows in the glass house to um, say, say a similar message, but we want to have a good photo of it. So no pressure, um, something which is kind of historic you're going to have to do and don't screw it up. So this is what we came up with. Um, they, uh, they did the windows and then... Um, I uh, went out there at night and took a photo of it. And um, actually, a friend of mine's uh, a friend of mine showed up to kind of you know watch the process. And he had a bullet Mustang, a S one D seven bullet Mustang, and he drove into the parking lot. I thought, yeah, why don't you do that again? And I'm going to capture the taillights with the camera. So that's kind of what that added a little bit of a visual element there. But yeah, Ford GT stuff is by far going to be the highlight of of what I got to do from a photography standpoint. I think um, really cool stuff. Um, there's Scott Dixon um, at Sebring and uh, road car stuff. We went to Utah, really cool stuff up there. Uh, went to the mountains, um, even, uh, you know, just the scenery there was beautiful. I was there for like a week and a half while the media drove, uh, drove the cars and Joey Hand was there to give people rides and talk to them. And um, it was a really, really great program. There's uh, Henry Ford III. Um, Actually, he was at Le Mans in 1966, um, but he was a young lad at the time. Or, I mean, uh, his dad was a young lad at the time. I'm sorry. Uh, Edsel, his dad was at, uh, at Le Mans in 1966. So he was about probably his age. Kind of interesting. But, yeah, we went to the mountains and did some cool stuff at uh, for 4G, 4GT production stuff. And, um, yeah, air, that's kind of cool. Got to do that. Um, we'll open it up for questions in a... Uh, if you guys have any questions about anything, um, then we can kind of share some stories as well. Um, if you guys have any questions at all, uh, I guess, Carrie, you want to see how you want to bring those in? Okay, you're finished with your, because um, I'll take the your screenshot down. You... Oh, sure, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, in fact, maybe, well, well and I was thinking of kind of sharing, I was thinking maybe of sharing some stories as well. Do you want to share some stories? Or maybe we probably should address a few questions before I go on to some of the... Sure. 
but uh, you Paul want Braun's to adventures. Yeah, are you finished with your presentation, or do you have more? Because I know people are enjoying sure. this. Is that it? Yeah, I'll, I can. I can. I'll, I'll, I'll resume it in a minute. So okay. Um, so cool. I, th I think I'm done sharing. Does that work? That works. Well, uh, thank you, Wes. That was very, very informative. Um, we appreciate that. Sure. And um, I, people have some questions, I'm sure. As you can tell, Wes is an incredible photographer, a uh, great tech a writer. You, many of you have probably, uh, if you were around when the magazines were around, <laughs> you probably saw a lot of Wes's uh, technical articles that he's written. Obviously, he's well-versed on cars. We are using him a lot in our business for different things. So uh, we're good friends with him, and he's just a great guy. Everything he touches, he puts his heart and soul into, and it, it's just, uh, you know, very positive and comes out well. So we do have uh, a discount I wanted to announce on the uh, on Wes's book. If you purchase it through the Kenny Brown uh, website, uh, everybody that is viewing the Cars and Coffee uh, right now will get, uh, we be able to purchase it for $29.95. So make sure you click on one of the links that we're sharing and put in the discount code CNC book. Uh, again, that CNC book on the Kenny Brown website and you'll get it a little cheaper. And the big point is it's going to be autographed. So Wes is uh, going to autograph each one of them uh, personally. So make sure you take advantage of that offer. Uh, let's see, we're going to go to some questions now. And Wes, I'm going to pull you up in just a minute on the screen. I'm going to get one of these questions. Uh, one of them I want to answer because it's on the SLA uh, before Wes, you start into it. So uh, Tony, uh, yes, did you guys ever put an SLA front end in the S197? Interesting that you may ask because Kenny has it developed. Uh, it's not all the way, but close enough where we can finish it off. So that is in the development plans. We just spoke about that this past week, uh, sort of the plan to get that out. So yes, uh, it's not on the market yet, but it will be shortly. Another thing I want to announce before Wes joins is we are going to be having uh, a K-Link workshop coming up in July. I believe it's July 21st. It's a Thursday night. So uh, we'll be sending out more information if you're on the Speed Therapy Society uh, Facebook page or if you get our newsletter, you will receive information on that. I'm sure we'll be advertising on the uh, Kenny Brown performance Facebook page as well. So make sure you look out for that. Uh, it was great. It's going to be a replay from Kenny introducing it, uh, kind of a private introduction uh, about seven or eight months ago before it was patented. We expect the patent to be here any day. Uh, I feel bad that it, the patent wasn't issued when he was here, but it's, it's any day now. Uh, so it's gotten through the majority of the patent process with no issues. So we're lo really looking forward to that. If people don't know what the K-Link is, I'm going to have uh, uh, Wes tell us a little bit about it because he's installed it. And he actually wrote the instructions for it, the install uh, video, and uh, took photography of us for us. So that's kind of how we're working with Wes. So he'll be able to tell you a little bit about what it does. Um, and uh, it's just a phenomenal pro product. It's a market uh, disrupting, disruptor product. Uh, we feel like first there was a Panhard bar, then there was a Watts link, and now there's the K link. It's for any live axle car. So uh, Wes will probably go into a little bit of it in a little bit. Um, so Wes, I'm going to put you back on the screen here, and then we will share. Uh, you can share. We'll answer some questions. Um, Brad, you may do you want me to read the questions, or would you like to? Uh, you can read the questions if you want. We had quite a few comments and we have quite a few people who are joining us. So I didn't know if you wanted to give everybody a, a shout out or not. I just have a couple things at the end and that's it. Okay. So cool. Uh, so let me find the first question, Wes. Um, this is this is where it takes a little bit because I have to look here. Um, Joe Johnson has a, uh, a comment. He says, my, oh my, what a great amount of information. I must have that book. And Joe, again, I'm going to give you guys, this is perfect opportunity for me to give you the discount code to purchase on KennyBrown.com. It is book or CNC book. So cars and coffee book is what it CNC stands for. CNC book and uh, Wes, Wes will autograph it and you'll get it for $29.95, which is a great price. Um, the next one, Cliff Glidden, uh, he was just saying hello to somebody. But Cliff, did you notice you're a number 44 car? 
in there. We may have to get that uh, photo from uh, Wes for you. Uh, Wes, uh, number 44 was purchased by Cliff Glidden, and he is uh, doing a lot of track events with it. He actually brought it here, and we did a lot of work on it. So I'm mm -hmm. sure it was really, it was fun for me to see it, and I'm sure, Cliff, you got a kick out of it as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Tony has uh, one question is, uh, this is for you, Wes, any IRS setup info in your book? Uh, no, I, so I don't have, well, um, because the S-187 Mustang is a solid axle, I don't really discuss uh, IRS stuff in that, uh, in the book. Um, there's obviously advantages to an IRS, but you know, the, the way that the solid axle is on the S-187, um, it's a lot more confidence inspiring to drive than earlier um, solid axles. So like a Fox body or like S1, or SN95, you know, the, the earlier solid axles, you kind of hit bumps and it would move around and wiggle around because there's a lot of rubber back there. And also it's located, um, it's asking a lot of the four links to do several different jobs. And so when Ford, um, they had an, obviously a, an opportunity to do a clean sheet design on the S197. And um, I think based on customer feedback, a lot of times too, a lot of customers are like, hey, because the IRS in the 1999 to 2004 Cobras was kind of compromised, um, Ford had to meet a lot of different um, requirements to make that work. So they made a lot of compromises and um, those compromises can be addressed by the way, but um, for out of the box, a lot of people didn't really like the IRS there. And so it kind of had a I want to say a less than favorable um, reputation. So with S187, they went with a solid axle. Um, it was a tried and true kind of thing, but it's a three link with a pattern bar, which is a proper design. And so that's why there's just a little bit, you know, if you replace rubber bushings with uh, spherical rod ends, um, change some of the geometry a little bit, um, it's a phenomenal suspension. So um, to answer your question, then there, I don't cover IRS in the uh, in this book particularly because this, these cars don't have IRS, but um, and I don't, and honestly, um, with say example, like with the K-Link, because the roll center moves down is, is lower than it can be with any other kind of uh, Panhard bar or a Watts link, you can get really very similar to uh, IRS performance out of the solid axle. Um, the only thing that a solid axle doesn't have that IRS does have is um, camber gain um, under, you know, compression. Um, but because the solid axle is always on the ground, um, you know, there's the camper is always going to be zero versus uh, versus positive, which would be, you know, if the wheels leaning up, that's a problem, too. So um, um, but anyway, I, that's a long roundabout way to say that I don't cover IRS stuff in the book. But um, that's just because the S187s don't have uh, don't have an IRS. Um, but maybe we need to do maybe we need to do a, a, a you know, 1999 and up. Cobra book that, um, or, you know, things that talk about IRS in there, because actually, I mean, I am, Kenny Brown actually has some really nice IRS products and they're kind of unique in the market in that way that they really have a lot of, uh, you know, with the cradle geometry that's modified, that's one control arms, upper and lower control arms are also um, a big advantage as well. So you can really take that suspension um, and take it quite a long way. Um, and in general, in an SN95 or Fox, from a solid axle to an IRS, uh, you know, back to back comparison, an IRS just has an inherent advantage um, in, in theory and you can make that you can bear that out with proper parts as well. Yeah. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. And so we have another one. And Michael, uh, I'm going to really butcher your last name. I'll say Michael R. And you might know him, Wes, because I think he came from your your promotion of the, the hmm. this, uh, okay. workshop. How do you, how do you spell the last name? Uh, R Y S L E C K I. Well, Rose interesting. Stan. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I, I put your yeah. name anyway. So anyway, he's from London, England. Oh, great. So, yeah. So, which is really cool. So he's not yeah. watching it in the morning. He's watching it in the afternoon, which is great. Anyway, great. his question is how does the performance of a fully modified S 197's rear end as in your book compare to an IRS and the S 550 and GT four? Oh, really good question. So, um, I think some I think some Ford engineers would probably the Ford performance engineers would probably have a better way to answer that. But put it this way, um, the an, uh, the IRS and the S five fifty is actually pretty good. Um, if you look at okay, put it uh, if we look at it also this way, in the GT four, um, there's people. Who, uh, so uh, Dean Martin is a guy who uh, 
they were Rehagen Racing for a while, and then he now does Core Motorsports. But they've he has experience driving and, and campaigning both um, the S197 cars, which were the FR500s, also Mustang Challenge cars, but uh, and then the new GT4. And um, the GT4 is way faster. Now, is it because of the suspension design? No, there's a lot of other things at play. Tires, for one, the Michelin tires are really, really good. But uh, you know, the, also the um, the Mustang GT4 is a 225 or 250 thousand dollar car. I can't remember off the hand offhand, but you know the FR500 was a lot less. It was more road car than it was race car. Where the Mustang GT4 is very much race car. Um, but then again, uh, engine power wise, they're probably roughly about the same. Um, so the S550, um, they actually have, uh, which I'll, I'll actually, if you have, you should you should subscribe to Mustang Hub Magazine because they actually are going to have a really deep technical dive. I go, I crawl all over the car, take photos of everything, which is something that um, really, I, I think the car deserved it. Um, but they have some pretty trick stuff on there. But ultimately, as far as I can tell, their only modifications, um, generally speaking, are um, spherical bearings instead of rubber bushings. Um, they have a different lower control arm, but I don't think there's really any geometry changes. It's more of just a strength issue because of the coilover uh, spring rates and damper rates that they run on those cars. But really, the, the magic is in uh, the dampers. Um, but other than that, they don't really, I don't think they change pickup points. I really don't think they change a whole lot in the rear suspension. So the rear suspension on the S550 is actually very, very good. That being said, um, a car, I bet you a car with a K Link, um, apples to apples comparison, a car with a K Link uh, S197 um, with the same tires um, is going to give a, you know, uh, an S550 a run for its money um, because. The front suspension is also really good on the S187 and S550. They're pretty much variations of the two. They both use struts. Um, they both have good uh, lower control arm geometry. Um, S550s have a dual ball joint knuckle, which is a little bit different. But um, I, I will say, you know, it's just that the Mustang GT4 is just a way faster car because it's just so much more capable gearbox and all that kind of stuff. Um, brakes are a lot bigger and better. Um, weight wise are pretty similar so um i don't know i guess the question is you know with a track car or whatever it's kind of what you like if you you know you're going to save you're going to build a cheaper uh, a less exp you're going to spend less money with an s197 than you will with s550 but then again in england s197 isn't available s550 is the card so if you have an s550 there's some really good stuff you can do there um most of it's just in springs and dampers um and just put more put as much tire under the car that you can fit, um, especially in the front. It's a front heavy car. So if you can, probably best to run some kind of square setup um, just to get the balance right. Um, of course, you know, having a staggered setup looks cool, but really you are you need to get as much front grip as you can. And you're gonna do that with the most amount of, the, the most amount of rubber you can fit on the front. Um, and so that's probably the best way to, you know, uh, improve that car. Hope that answers your question kind of. Oh, I guess you asked about an IR. Oh, the IRS was the S550. Yeah. So Ford went to an IRS at the S550 um, for a reason. Um, they wanted the car to be competitive globally from a marketing standpoint. And, you know, a, a stick axle car is not really going to do it um, in places other than the United States. People don't get it. Um, so they're going to, you know, they want, they want the IRS. And the IRS is just, it's a better riding suspension. I have to say, I drove a, I had the S197 for this book for a long time. And it drove, it was light years ahead of, a, of older cars. Um, but the new current chassis is better yet. I mean, from a from a um, noise and vibration standpoint, from a handling standpoint, it feels like a, the S187 feels, I don't want to say truck-like, but it, it feels like you're just kind of in the car. Where an S550, it's a sports car. Um, both great cars, but um, the S550 is a bit more, it's a bit smaller feeling. Um, it's just more of a GT car than uh, the uh -huh. S, the earlier chassis, like on the, you know, the S197 is more of a, um, it's more of a muscle car. And uh, the new one is definitely a sports car. So hope that, hope that answers the questions. So uh, before I ask the next question, I, I want you to talk a little bit more about Mustang Hub because it's an incredible magazine and I don't think it gets uh, the appreciation that it needs because it's a fairly new magazine. So it just needs Yeah, yeah. Needs Good point. Hard. You know, yeah, I should have. So print is not dead. Um, point is, though, is that um, there is room, you know, obviously print is not the way that people get their news nowadays. But as far as if you want to read good in-depth 
um, well-crafted stories and information, Mustang Hub is actually a really good magazine to do that. And it's uh, it kind of the, the editor of Mustang Hub is a former editor of Muscle Mustangs. Um, really good guy. Uh, Henry De Los Santos is fantastic. Um, he's fantastic to work with, but also he gets it um, in his. So it's a great, the pictures are always great in that magazine. It uses good paper. Um, I don't know even what, how much it is to subscribe a year. It's, it's not, it's like maybe 25 bucks or something. I mean, it's insignificant. It, it's well worth the amount of money. Um, and so there's a lot of good stuff that we have in there. And May, um, I contribute a lot to the magazine because I believe in it. And it's a great outlet to really share some in-depth information with people, including like this deep dive on the Mustang GT4 that we're going to do. It's, um, I think, I think Henry's, I talked to Henry about it. And he's, I think he's going to set aside like 12 pages for this, which it needs it because I talk about tons of stuff. I talk to Ford people. I talk to uh, people who race them. Um, I talk about all the details of it. I go through a lot of the information that you don't normally get because a lot of people don't know about the Mustang GT4. So it's um, it's quite a it's quite a piece of kit. But what's nice about them is is they're an independent magazine, so they can say, "Hey, we want to do 12 pages on this." Um, do you know when that's coming out? So people, I, by the way, I put a link in the comments to Mustang Hub, so you can. Mm -hmm. Uh, click on there. It's just mustanghub.com if you don't. Yeah, see I should have. Yeah, I should have had one handy. Sorry, but um, yeah, you know, um, I got I got a whole. Go sorry, I'm just wondering if you know when it's coming out or is it already been yeah, published. So the there's um, the it, it should be in the I think it's going to be in the fall issue. Um, I it it could get shifted a little bit because it was a big chunk and I just gave it to him a few weeks ago and he said he'll put it in the next he was going to put it in the issue that he was working on which one is due in my mailbox any day now it's not making any of that one so it's going to be the next one I think it's the fall issue they have four issues a year um, wish they would have more because we have more stuff to want to share that we want to share in there but maybe that'll happen eventually but um, I think it's going to be the fall the fall issue this year which should come out in like September or August maybe it's the winter issue I can't remember anyway it's One's going to come in my mailbox any day. Oh, it's not that one. It'll be the one that's three months later. So we'll, um, but yeah, it should be in that one. So definitely that's worth subscribing. Um, if you, you know, we have quality mm -hmm. people writing stories like Wes and his mm -hmm. photography will be in there. So that's awesome. Okay. Our next question here is, and if you have any questions for Wes, remember he's kind of an S197 guru and, you know, nerd. obviously box guru. What? <laughs> nerd, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you are a little bit nerdy. So that's not a bad thing. Uh, so the next question is for uh, Ford starters don't, this is a in response to something you mentioned. It says Ford starters don't need shimming like the others. So the bolt struggle thing is worth it. Fair point. That's a good point. I didn't thought about that. But yeah, you're talking about basically you get your gear mesh. You don't, you can't screw up the gear mesh because the bolts are there. Um, it's the bolts are essentially dowels to locate it. So that's fair. Yeah, that's fine. But you know what I'm saying though, like getting that top bolt, oh, such pain. I tell you what though, um, having a K member, like a Kenny Brown, uh, front K member, you can use, you can see the bolts, which is helpful. And then number two, you can use extensions and swivels like swivel sockets, uh, which I have right here, like these kind of things, like a swivel socket right here. Um, that helps. Um, because it's low profile and then you use a big extension, which I also have long extension that helps, um, get to those bolts. Um, but yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah. I didn't thought about that. Um, so I learned something new every day, but so I guess I'll still swear at it, but I just won't swear as loudly. <laughs> that's good. Okay. I'm going to go through some of these comments. A lot of people are buying your book. Um, Great. Yeah. So anyway, operators are standing by. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I'm I'm right book. Thank you, Joe. I just saw you popped up. Yeah. So uh, Cliff Glenn says, very cool presentation. I'm just reading some of the comments for you. Um, Wes, thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, uh, Brian West, good presentation. Uh, let's see. Another, I can't. Can yeah, okay. and we can get into some stories as well too. I kind of have some stuff to share and go back to a presentation that about that. Maybe funny. another fifteen minutes or so. But okay, yeah, let's let's do that. Here's another one. Bill Wellman uh, says, "Thank you for the awesome presentation. I will be getting the book. Great book. I have an early S197 with a 4.63 valve. I got got it for the suspension stuff. And mm -hmm. we have another question in here. That's well, I'll read it when I get there. Um, let's see. Just bought the book. 
Joe Johnson, and then we also have Brian West uh, purchased the book earlier this week, probably uh, when he learned about it. Uh, Wes, can you talk about the pros and cons of the different types of superchargers? That's like almost a subject in itself. Is that a come uh, back Yeah, but you know what? Um, it, it, it's a good point. Uh, and actually, uh, the, just real quickly on the comment about um, the early S187 car. Yeah, three-valve cars are cool. I mean, um, you can actually, I kind of wish I had a three-valve car because um, you can put those uh, those camshaft options that are kind of cool. Um, there are... Um, there's an intake manifold that I don't know if Ford still offers for that car anymore, but you can find it. Um, so there's some cool stuff you can do to a uh, three valve. It's just, you're starting from a disadvantage and you're never really going to make the kind of power that you do with a coyote, but that's fine because like, you don't really need all that much power. Um, there's car people who race, uh, that's called the, uh, American, what's it called? Uh, spec iron, um, that, uh, NASA does. And those are S one seven Mustangs. And, there's very little that you have to do to those cars to make them a good track car. Make plenty of power. The way a friend of mine described uh, who works at Ford, he said it's like a um, it's like it's like it's like a spec Miata but with a way better soundtrack, and it uses a lot more gas. <laughs> but um, on the supercharger thing, you know, um, pros and cons. I so I like uh, from experience. Um, I've never had a turbo V8 car. Um, I, I do have a Focus ST, and I have to say, I'm sure a lot of it's tuning, but I have to say. I'm not a huge fan of the power delivery of turbos as far as drivability on the street, because I kind of feel like it doesn't have, I'm kind of kind of playing seesaw with the throttle. So let's set turbo aside for a moment, because that's a little bit of a different animal, but um, a centrifugal blower, um, I haven't had, I didn't have a centrifugal blower on an S197, but I had one on a Fox that I really, really liked. And what was cool about that is I think a centrifugal blower works really well for a car that has, for a motor that has a lot of torque. And so a push rod Fox has tons of torque, totally runs out of, it, it runs out of breath at 4,000. I mean, the party is over at 4,000 RPM. It just blah, it lays over. So a centrifugal blower will make more power as the engine spins faster. And so it actually fills that. So here you have the torque from the, you know, the torque from the, um, from the, from the push rod motor. And then it just kind of goes blah, and game over. But the the Vortec or something or a centrifugal, you know, Vortec packs and Pro Charger builds power on the top end, so it actually fills in the hole perfectly. And it made uh, for it. So for an engine that has a lot of torque, um, that's tuned for torque, the centrifugal blower is awesome. Um, they're a little bit less weight, I would say, too, um, installation wise. It's about the same amount of complexity. But now then, uh, for example, in the book we put a roots blower on it. Um, so it was a it was an Edelbrock. Um, it's really heavy, um, really well designed. Um, so if, and also there's a lot of room to grow there. Um, I feel, put it this way, Ford um, doesn't put centrifugal blowers on cars and doesn't put turbos on V8s. Not sure exactly why I've always wanted to ask that question, but I think essentially from having um, like this car that's perpetually in a state of undress over here, I have an 03 Cobra. I have to say the, um, a roots blower is like your end it's just like the engine's bigger it has more power all the time um it's not soft it has plenty of torque down low and it just keep pulling so um and we look at the gt 500s that they've that's ford's done they're all that kind of blower and i think that's because i think it's just it it's a more straightforward foolproof way to make power may not be the most efficient but it's a it's just like it's like you just took the engine and just turned it up to 11. so um I don't know. You know, it just depends on what you want to do for both. Honestly, I would say if you have an S one eighty seven, a Coyote car, um, and you're doing track and want to do track work, um, you can make a lot of power naturally aspirated. Four hundred wheel horsepower or in excess of four hundred wheel horsepower is a lot of power. Um, maybe I'm a wimp, but I mean, to me, I don't really want more power than that on the road. We put the Edelbrock blower on that um, white car for the book, and it was fast. It was really fast. The kids loved it, but it was really fast. I mean, almost stupid fast. Uh, more than you can really use in um, on a in a track day, you're going to have heat soak. I don't, I, I didn't, we didn't do a lot of track work on that car, so I don't know. But I mean, in general, you're going to have heat soak. I think heat is just going to be, uh, you know, something you're just going to have to expect. And it's not a, it's, I'm not knocking it. It's just that that's just what's going to happen. It just, it generates a lot of heat. Um, and so, naturally, I would stick with the naturally aspirated combination um, for just a track dedicated track car. But if you want to have fun on the street and blow the tires off at will, a roots blower is going to be the way to do it. 
Um, centrifugal blower is also good. It's a little bit less weight. It's probably a high, you know, you could say it's, if you wanted to have supercharged power, but um, a little bit less weight up front, um, then it, like a Vortec or a Pro Charger is another good way to do it. But on the Vortec or Pro Charger, um, packaging is also a bit of an issue um, in an S197. Um, it's not as it's not as elegant of a as like on the old pushrod cars, you know, where the blower was just off on the side and then just fed right into the intake. Here, you, you know, you have intercooler stuff and then the blower is over here. And then on a Pro Charger, it sucks hot air from above the headers, which I've never really been a fan of. Vortec is a little bit different, but it's convoluted. So uh, anyway, hope that kind of answers the question. It's a matter of what you like. It's choose what you like, honestly. Um, but um, naturally aspirated is not a bad option either. And Kenny always loved naturally aspirated. He did a lot of superchargers, a root, root style supercharger is what he preferred. Mm -hmm. But yeah, naturally aspirated on the track is awesome. Um, mm -hmm. Here's another question for you, Wes. Um, it's not really a question, but I'm going to let you uh, solidify the answer for this. Uh, mm -hmm. In your how to modify your S197 11 to 14, uh, that, does it apply to the S197 05 to 12 or to 10? Mm -hmm. So, oh, does it? It was it. Yeah, I'm sorry. It, was it? Yeah, it does it, it apply? Yeah, everything. So basically, um, there's a, I mean, all of this table of content stuff, all of it does, except for the motor. So the motor and the PCM tuning will be different. But other than that, I mean, we talk about the history of stuff. I mean, you know, a little bit of Mustang history, which is cool. Um, just gives a, back, a lot of background, actually, on the Coyote engine and why it makes more power than earlier ones. A lot of information in here. I talked with um, an engineer who was uh, involved in the, in the very genesis of the engine and a lot of cool stuff that nobody ever really considered before. So, um, I mean, put it this way. I, if you have an earlier generation, 80% of this stuff is going to apply to you. And even all the theory stuff is still going to be the same, even on like roll centers and weight transfer and brake kit stuff and all that is, um, that, that's all, that all applies. So, I mean, honestly, I, it, it's technically narrowed down to those year models because of the engine stuff that's in it, but the rest of it all, rest of it all applies. Um, but yeah, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the stories and stuff, I think people might appreciate um, sure, for you know especially with Paul and all that. But it's up to you if there's any other pertinent questions. Yeah, there's a couple more questions. I think one more. Let's see. Oh, there's there's more. Um, I think people will people will probably hang on and listen to your stories too. I know unless you want to throw a story and then we'll go back to questions. No, it's fine. So, I mean, we have a couple more questions. It's up to you. Yeah. So, so below this, we had Michael from uh, London, um, who says a cold air intake is a very popular Mustang road modification. The GT4 balance of performance uses the standard OEM airbox and filter. Are the road modders wasting their time and money with uh, cold air inlets and cone filters? Which my answer is going to be yes. But I'd like to hear your take on that. Actually, that's a really good question. Um, well, it's yeah, it's um, and the answer is complicated. So um, the GT4 uses a 2011 to 14 intake on it, manifold, manifold, intake manifold. And that's because they said it's just cheaper and it made the power targets. You have to understand for a Mustang GT4, power production, um, power production, all of power production was not the goal. For the Mustang GT4, um, good torque, and a broad power band was the goal. So the point is make as much power early and make that power all the way to 88,000, 8,200 RPM. And it does. It makes the same power. It's just like a shelf. It's not peak power. It's the same power. And the the, the intake manifold they use is the 2011-14, which is crazy because it has GT40 or GT350 cylinder heads, has GT350 cams, all this stuff. But that being said, a GT, if you're looking for maximum power production looking at the mustang gt4 is really not shouldn't be your yardstick because they have different um they have different priorities and their priority was good power production and the point is if you make too much power this the series is just going to scale you back anyway and they run a i can't remember now i think it's like a 55 millimeter restrictor and they, they use air restrictors right uh, ahead of the throttle body to adjust power so um, unrestricted, it probably makes really good power, but restricted, you're, it's got to suck through a 55 millimeter hole. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's pretty small. So the factory airbox is plenty of power or plenty of airflow for a 55 millimeter restrictor. And actually one of the um, things that um, one of the engineers mentioned 
was that the he found actually the inlet where the grill is, where the air comes through the grill. You know, when you, it's when you get your air box in there, it's kind of hard to get that thing adjusted and set up where it gets into this the scoop that feeds it um, from the grill. He said, actually, that can be actually a restriction right there. Um, it's, I think maybe his context was more if you don't get it fit right. It's got to fit in there right, because if it's not fitting there right, that's going to be a restriction. But they use that factory air box. That being said, are there gains to be in the by changing to a different air box? Probably. Um, there's really no gains in throttle bodies. In my view, it's not worth juice is not worth the squeeze as far as changing a throttle body because you change a whole bunch of uh, predicted airflow um, adjustments and things like that, and it, it messes with the computer. It, the computer wants to know how much airflow it's going to move with a certain throttle angle, and if it's flowing more, that's not what it. it it's not what it was counting on and it can cause issues. So um, unless if you run a forward larger throttle body, they have all that figured out. But you, know, you can't just do that by the seat of your pants and adjust that anyway. But the point is, um, there are advantages in going to a larger, probably a larger cold air intake and that kind of stuff. That being said, it helps to tune using the HP tuner software tune the mass airflow sensor to that uh, adjusted uh, the, the larger flow. The reason you have to do it is because um, the mass airflow sensor will measure flow, but the point is that the tube that it's uh, if the tube is larger, the sensor is only still measuring what it thinks is flow through a smaller tube, and so its estimates are going to be off. You're going to get that more. You're going to get more in there, but the uh, it's going to have an error as far as um, in there's only a certain window of error that the computer will allow before it raises a flag and it you know does a check engine light and you have to go in limp home mode or something until it thinks something's wrong. So um, you can go a lar to a larger tube without tuning the computer, but you can only go so large until there's an issue. But you can go as large, you can go much larger if you want, um, if you tune the mass airflow sensor, which cover in the book. So um, anyway, but larger cone, air, cone air filters and all that kind of stuff, not necessarily a waste. Um, it's going to be minimal. You're going to want to do some other tuning as well. Um, but the biggest gains really with the with the um, are in. Well, I guess in tuning, but also exhaust work. Um, and then really in different intake manifold, we did a cobra jet intake manifold, which was also um, good, made good power. So I hope that answers that question, but it's, it kind of a depends. But point is, don't look at the Mustang GT4 as the epitome of power, because that's not, that wasn't the goal. Yeah, that's a really good answer, Wes. Yeah, it is. And I'm going to take a, just a quick break here, because I know we're like after the one hour mark. And now you can see why we did not uh, play Kenny Brown video because uh, Wes has a wealth of knowledge that he's sharing and he has a ton of really cool stories. So I want to let you know we're going to continue on. So if you have to break and leave, uh, make sure you come back and watch the rest of it. It's going to be worthwhile. I also want to let you know, again, if you've just joined us lately, uh, Wes has written a book on how to build and modify your S197 Mustang for 2011 to 14 um, S. Uh, 197. So uh, we have a we are selling on our website and uh, you get a discount through the cars and coffee and the discount code is CNC book. Uh, so now there's cars and coffee book CNC book. So make sure you purchase it. You'll get it for twenty nine ninety five. And the big bonus, not the discount necessarily, but the big bonus is Wes will autograph it for you. So make sure you go on the Kenny Brown dot com website and uh, order that book. Uh, it's well worth it. A lot of people have purchased it and are just blown away with it. Okay, let's get back to a couple questions. Wes, you're still good to hang on with us? I was born ready. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so let's see, uh, uh, Bill, we still have questions coming in, Bill. I mean, um, Wes, so we're going to answer those first. Uh, Bill, uh, thoughts on V6 models? Oh, V6. I thought you said B6. I was like, uh, <laughs> we're talking about like Alpina, B6, BMWs. Anyway, uh, there's actually some stuff in here about V6 models. Um, so chassis stuff all applies. We talk a little bit more in theory. I don't, obviously I didn't use a V6 uh, model to do any of this stuff, but yeah, I mean, the the, the engine, uh, there was diff two different ones that were used in there. I think there's a 3.7 and then a 3.4. Four liter. Four liter. Oh, is that what it was? Okay. Yeah. And I can't remember the difference between the two, but um, when some of them came in, but actually they make they make good power. I mean, it's um, yeah, it's plenty fine. In fact, you could probably make you know a decent amount of power. Um, the same you can sadly make the same amount of power as you can with a three valve with a V six pretty easily. 
Um, that's kind of part of the reason why they wanted to do the coyotes. Like our, our V sixes are going to make as much power as that three valve did. So, um, anyway, yeah, V six are good. The balance will be good. Um, all the chassis stuff's the same brakes. You can outbreak everybody because it's lighter. Um, so yeah, that's another good option. Uh, V sixes are great. Um, to me, I'm a V eight guy cause I in particular about sound. And so to me, a V eight is going to make the sound I want and give me the soundtrack I want. And to me, that's with a car. I'll tolerate a lot. If the sound is awesome, I'll tolerate a lot. So, here's so another. go ahead, Brad. Yeah, another question Jorge has. Um, this is an easy answer because they're completely different cars. Um, what are some of the improvements that will fit in a Fox and SN95 from the S197? So, again, those are completely different cars, different suspensions. You know, um, I think it's yeah. probably not, but what is your thought? Yeah, there's very, no, there's very, I mean, as far as bolts and stuff, there's really nothing. Um, they're, because they are completely different. That's where um, the the Fox and SN95 are very similar. And so um, they all had the same advantages and also the, all the same problems. But um, S197 is completely different. Coyote swaps are even pretty, you know, it's not as easy as you think it's going to be, um, that kind of stuff. Um, hopefully some suspension parts that we currently do for S197 will be for adapted for Fox and uh, SN95 as well uh, eventually. But working on that but the um yeah there's really not a not a whole lot um but a fox and sn95 cart there well foxes are not cheap anymore sn95s are cheap though and um you can find them all day long especially a two valve three 4.6 car cheap as long as you find um one that's not you want one with as few owners as possible and as little miles as possible and no accidents and you can find them pretty cheap and uh, those are really fun cars um they take a little bit more work to make work um and drive predictably but that's what kenny brown is for um so they have lots of stuff for that um but yeah there's not a whole lot that translates between the two and working on s197 is just so much easier because it's just physically larger there's the engine bay is just large enough that actually you can fit your hand down between the engine and the strut towers cobra no way it's just it's everything's difficult because they were packing 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag uh with s uh, sn95 and the fox this ball sn95 with a mod motor for sure so um, anyway but i still love them because those are my those are, those are my jam but yeah so i hope that answers the question a little bit so if you're enjoying Wes dunkel um the, just you know we've had to change uh, modify the cars and coffee format because kenny's no longer with us uh if you're enjoying Wes. um and you think of somebody else you'd like to hear interviewed or um, you know spend some time with on Cars and Coffee, please put that in the comments so we know, and we will contact those people. I know last week uh, uh, somebody wanted to hear something about transmissions, so we're working on that. So anyway, just wanted to throw that in at you. Uh, Brad, do you want to ask the next question? If you're not ready, Brad, I can ask it. Oh, so... Um... Several people like Wes's 03 Cobra, uh, by the way. Um, there's a few comments on that. But Joe, Joe Johnson had a question. Uh, what are you thinking about installing 410 or 430 gears in a Shelby GT350 or um, S550 yeah. GT, I guess? It was yeah, that's a good question. Gear wise, you know what? Um, I kind of go against the grain on the philosophy of rear gears. Um, that 85 Mustang I had probably because I didn't know how to change them, but I had 273 gears in that car. Um, and um, I changed to 355s and in the quarter mile, I really didn't pick up that much because I was traction limited regardless. Um, you're shifting more in the quarter mile with 355 gears versus 273s. Um, so if you have slicks, different ball game, right? You're gonna have more mechanical advantage on those slicks and you're gonna be able to use them more. But as far as if you're traction limited, you're going to spin in first gear, whether you have 273s or you have 355s, it doesn't matter. I'm not a, to me, I'm not a big, maybe because I don't have a lot of experience with steeper gears, but to me, you're going to lose mileage. You're going to lose drivability. Uh, one thing that, that rear gears will do if you have a, a tall, I mean, a shorter rear gear set is that it will bring all of the transmission ratios closer together. So it's going to make your transmission more of a short ratio box, close ratio box. That being said, the the current transmissions are pretty much close ratio boxes anyway so uh, to me i mean 373 gears 
um, were in a in that S197 that I did for the book, and they are also I also drove a performance pack S550 with 373 gears, and to me, in my mind, that is all the gear that that car needs. It doesn't need anything more because you're driving on the highway and you're spinning fast anyway. The gear ratios are close enough. Um, you're going to just use more gas with 430 gears or 411 gears. Um, and if you don't have the tire on there to take advantage of them, I mean, uh, Mustang GT4 has 331s um, because also in fourth gear uh, or sixth gear on the GT4 is top gear and it's one to one. And so it's like fourth gear in a normal gearbox or, a, you know, whatever is one to one or like a MT82 is sometimes direct as five is fifth gear. So anyway, Point is on a on a track or something like that, you're gonna you don't want to necessarily be in overdrive anyway because overdrive is not it's not really shouldn't really be a power gear. Um, some people drive it like a power gear and are at full throttle at high speed in, in overdrive, but really your goal with your rear gears should be um, full throttle, fourth gear, top speed in fourth gear. So whatever gear that takes to get that, usually a 355 is going to be what, what it is. 373 is even a bit too steep. It depends on your speed. But um, And also, the more uh, the closer your ratios are, the more you're shifting and you're wasting time, uh, you know, shifting it. This is not a Honda. You don't, you know, you don't, this is not a Peaky power plant. It's not a BMW M3 with a 4 liter. This is a 5 liter or a 4.6. They have tons of torque. Use the torque. Um, third gear is going to be the gear you're in most of the time. Second gear for slow corners, third gear for most corners, fourth gear on the straightaways, and that's it. Um, so I would avoid, for track use, I would leave the gears alone. Um, 355s is good. 373s is more than enough. So we have another question here. Um, actually, a comment. I want, This is when I was referencing uh, continuing on over 11 o'clock. Uh, so it says, I'm watching this while making banana pudding, so I have plenty of time. <laughs> thought that was good. I understand. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. Um, yeah, Kenny would appreciate that because he was such a, a cook slash chef, so that, that's that's great. Um, let's see, Bob Jones uh, says, hey, you want to know if I can stop by and visit with you, Carrie? Bob, of course, anytime you're welcome. Uh, anybody that wants to stop by the Kenny Brown facility, you're more than welcome to. Just yeah, give us a little heads up. But, Bob, yes, just uh, call me or text me and let me know when you're going to be by. I'd love, 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 love to see you. So he is actually, Bob Jones was actually uh, in the Speed, Speed Therapy Academy. And so, you know, we just love those Speed Therapy Academy guys. Okay. Do we have any other questions, Brad, that I missed or you missed? think we're good. Yeah, so, we can do uh, that. Uh, talk about some stories. I'll, I'll share my yeah. screen again because I have some pictures okay. to go along with those. Okay, great. That would be wonderful. Yeah, you'll appreciate this stuff. Okay, cool. Let's see. Let me try to share screen. Uh, share screen. Hang on. While he's sharing the screen, um, I want to wish all of you a happy Father's Day and give the um, uh, Wes, some thumbs up if you like what you're you're learning from him. I think this has been just wonderful. I knew it would be. He's just a great guy and has a, a wealth of knowledge. Okay, Wes, you, it looks like you have it up again. So I will great, yeah. add your some, middle fingers. Middle fingers are fine too. Just um, but I just <laughs> it is what it is. That's good. Um, so this was just some. Uh, I got to do some cool stuff for Ford too. These that you may recognize if you have a GT350 poster. This was used for a poster, which is cool. This is another like 15 minutes and get it done kind of thing. Um, this was something we did back in 2013. Um, this is also was turned into a poster for GT500. So that was a neat photo. Um, yeah, the desert. Remember what I said about the desert island car? Like if I were on a tropical island and I only want one car, this is a close second uh, to my current. Uh, uh, Cobra, but uh, I still like to have a car with three pedals. Um, that's Evan Smith right there, actually, Carrie and uh, and Brad. Uh, Evan Smith was doing uh, the driving for this burnout shot. That's a great um, shot. Wow. Yeah, yeah. This was uh, back in Las Vegas. Anyway, um, this is also used for a poster too. Uh, Keith Weston, the guy who was, um, was an engineer on the program, is driving the car there too. So um, one thing actually kind of cool, Mach 1, great car. Um, this is a uh, Mach one in um, development. And so they Ford used this and had me come out and do some photos of its development. And then of course, um, when they did a drive with uh, had customers come out and do a drive that um, it, uh, it also flies Mach one flies. Who knew? But anyway, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, some cool Mach 1 stuff. Yeah, so if actually, if you go to the Ford website and uh, think of the Mustang page, has Mach 1 photos. These are all photos that we did uh, in May of 2020 uh, in Detroit. Um, Mustang 2 fans, I know you got to be out there. Um, you know, just keep this in mind. People talk about the Mach E and kind of mock the Mach E. The Mustang 2 was also mocked quite a bit, but they sold the heck out of Mustang 2s. So, anyway, uh, some portraits. That's there's Mustang GT4. Um, something to talk about there. So, Paul, Aww. obviously, I knew Paul. Yeah. And, you know, Paul is one of those guys um, where um, he was a do it yourselfer, right? I mean, he just did, he was a racer. That's what I would put it as. There are race, there are people who like to race, and there are racers who eat, breathe, uh, live it constantly. And it was whatever it was to get to the track. So here he is in a hotel room. Uh, this is at Barber that weekend too. And he's like, I got to get the right patches on my suit. That's, that's the point, you know, and some people kind of don't take it seriously. He took, he, he understood sponsors and he understood relationships because that's the only way he would get to the track. And I mean, you know, leveraging, leveraging, leveraging those relationships and sponsors. He was, he did, he would never, he would not burn a bridge. Um, even maybe when he should have burned a bridge, but I mean, he would never burn a bridge because you never know when that person's, I mean, I, I don't think this was conscious. I think it was subconscious, but the point is, you know, you'd always, uh, foster those relationships and he knew people everywhere because he took the time to talk to the people, you know, and, and, and um, share the passion of, of Mustangs. So, um, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, budgets always on a budget. Right. So it, he was a prankster. But yeah, he's this is uh, in mid Ohio um, taking tires to, uh, you know, be mounted or whatever. We didn't have golf cart or a tire rack like a, or a tire trailer. Pfft, who has a tire trailer? Just use a rental car. He's like, I, he's like, he's like, yeah, I got this. So he just threw all the tires on the rental car and we took it over to the tire tire busters. Uh, man. Oh, anyway. Funny. Yeah, this is funny. So this is Paul here. Uh, I have to say this is probably a really interesting story. So this is when I did my internship. Um, I. I had no idea what sports car racing was, or at least I, I, I knew, I thought I figured out what it would be, but it was not what I expected. So professional sports car racing, I thought, well, you know, we're going to, this is a sports car racing team. They're going to have, I read, there's a book that was uh, race car vehicle dynamics. And I bought that book before doing my internship because I thought I need to understand, you know, how this roll centers work and how spring rates work and how weight transfer work and how tires work and loading and camber and all this stuff. I need to know how to set up a car, you know, cause that's what we're going to talk about and here. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, pro sports car racing, we're going to have scales. We're going to be checking alignments. We're going to be, you know, making small adjustments to the, to the, to the chassis setup. I, my first race, I show up with uh, Mike Tiederman, who was at HP Motorsport and met Paul there, who was there at practice for, we, we met him uh, after we went there Friday night, drove through the night to get there Saturday morning. And this is what I find Paul doing. So pro racing, I learned with uh, Paul was not about setting up the car and making small adjustments. It was about keeping motors together and keeping all the parts in the motor inside the motor and not coming outside of the motor. So um, probably one of the things, um, who knows, there were rumblings and grumblings about, you know, who, who was building Paul's engines and whatever. But, you know, it was one of those things where Paul had a relationship with his engine builder and he, you know, he he would not um, he, he was just loyal to him to the Bill, end. Wasn't and it? So, was it Bill? I, I don't know. I'm not sure who it was, but I mean, anyway, and I, I don't know who it was. And, and I'm, I'm just speaking from what I remember. Uh -huh. you know, but some people were like, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure, but some people were like, you know, you got to check it. Try, because if you keep blowing engines, you need to try a different engine builder. They, you know, they were saying, and Paul's like, oh, you know, whatever. He just, who knows? But regardless, um, yeah, it was well keeping engines together. So there was an engine that he broke in practice. Um, actually, I'll go back to this one because it's still about this, but he broke it in practice. And so they had another blown engine in the trailer. Well, uh, we got two blown engines. There should be enough parts here to put one engine together. So we spent the whole night putting the engine together. And the problem was one of the pistons was really, the pistons were really loose in the new motor's bores. Like like six out of the, or two out of the eight pistons were really loose. There was something up. The uh, skirts were collapsed or something. And so Mike Tiener was like, well, I know how to fix this. This is old school stuff. He said, give me a center punch. So we took a center punch and punched, made dimples in the skirts of the pistons that were loose that had piston slap or that, that where the skirts were collapsed. Because when you sit, when you take a center punch and you punch that, um, the skirt, it'll mushroom up the material around it and actually, you know, make it bigger in that area. So he's like, yeah, this it's called knurling a piston. I guess it was a thing like back in the, you know, back in the old engine building days, you would, you could knurl a piston to like make it bigger. I'm like, okay. So anyway, threw it together and sure enough, engine 
uh, made a hell of a lot of noise, but it ran. And Paul went out and finished fifth in that race, I believe, uh, at Mid-Ohio. And it was very, very, very different. I was like, okay, so this is what sports car racing is like, is just keeping stuff from breaking. So anyway, um, but also an my incredible car, racer, just incredible driver. Yeah, so, he could, he would drive, he'd, he'd, he would just drive the hell out of a car. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he'd make some, I remember, you know, he'd make a couple chassis adjustments, maybe, but he wasn't super versed in it. It was just kind of like, I'm going to move the track bar up or down because I know when it does this, it does this. And that was about it. But I mean, I don't ever remember making suspension adjustments or anything. It was just, he was like, man, I just go and drive the car and drive the hell out of it. And, um, you know, and, and it is what it is. Um, so that was, yeah, that was something. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, another thing too, he always was, there were always people around Paul because he was helping somebody. If, if we weren't working on his car, he was over there helping like Walt Deathier here with the, this uh, 93 car. He had a valve, he had a cylinder head problem or something. So we were pulling the heads off that thing too. And it was just because, he, you know, anybody had a problem. If he was, if they were a shade tree kind of guy, you know, he wouldn't be over there with, uh, with Pratt and Miller with the Cadillac team helping them out because they didn't need the help. But th he was a, he understood the uh, club racing guy coming out and trying to race on, uh, you know, trying to race in pro racing and, and making a go of it. And so, and he helped everybody. It was there was always people around who were paddocked together, who were just the, you know, the circus and um, you know, everybody helping everybody. If he wasn't working on his car, he was working on somebody else's car. They had grease all up and down. So, anyway, uh, this is interesting. So I got my first speeding ticket in this vehicle. Um, I was in in Ohio driving th in the you know driving late at night, coming back from I think we we're coming back from Trois Rivière. I think anyway, driving back to Omaha. And in Ohio, used to be, and I think it may be in some, sometimes we were probably on I-80 and speed limits for cars was 65. The speed limit for trucks was 55. While I'm going along with traffic, you know, maybe 66 miles an hour or something like that, police pulls us over. Like, okay, great. So um, I drove this thing a little bit. Actually, I should probably just take a step back. This is the first time I'm driving a big truck with air brakes or anything like that. Um, we're going down the highway. Paul says, here, you drive. I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, you drive, I'm tired. I was like, okay. So I, he just says, here, we just, you just grab the wheel and come on over. So we just did a hot swap or whatever on the highway and I'm driving. He says, I said, what do I got to do if I stop? He says, don't stop, just keep going. It's fine. We got plenty of gas. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, but yeah, then I was driving it later that trip and um, um, Stinky Pinky was the car, was, was the name of it. Cause you can see the front of it was red, but it was faded. So and it was something wrong with the ejector pump too. So it was really rich. So that's why it was really stinky. So uh, it, its name was called Stinky Pinky. But anyway, um, driving in the in Ohio middle of the night, this cop pulls me over, give him my license. He's like, you don't have a CDL for this. I said, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Like what's, what's the problem? Paul comes up, he says, oh yeah. He says, yeah, this is an RV. We don't need a CDL for this. I'll show you the registration papers. So the state trooper was less than pleased. So um, he goes back to his car and has us come out of, you know, out of the truck and all that stuff. And he's back in his car for a while. It comes back out. And he says, yeah, okay, well, yeah, I guess you don't need a CDL for this because it's an RV because it has a bathroom in it. But uh, so then I'm going to give you a ticket for speeding anyway. So I, he gave me a ticket for speeding because I think he was kind of irritated that he thought he was going to get me for driving without a CDL, which should you, should you have a, a commercial driver's license for driving a truck like this with air brakes and all that and like a, you know, a, a two speed rear end and all that? Absolutely. Did I need one? Did I have one? Absolutely not. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, that was uh, that was a learning experience. This is uh, I mean, I've never driven anything like this. I never even driven a pickup truck. So anyway, oh, that was a fun story. That's cool. Uh, and at, at some point, I'm going to share with uh, with uh, you guys uh, Kenny's stories of driving uh, semis and stuff like that. <laughs> He's got a number of them that are really good. But go on. Yeah. Go it's on always that. an adventure. Yeah. So here's yes. that. Here, Here's this car the showing up at Road Atlanta um, just after building this brand new car. Um, didn't really have a space for us. We were late as always, and we showed up a little bit late. But the point is this car, um, World Challenge at the time was really overgrown street cars. Um, this was really kind of a cross between a Trans Am car and, um, and a road car. And so when we showed up, everybody was like, that doesn't belong in this. This is a Trans Am car. So it was kind of revolutionary at the time. It was pretty, you know, it was pretty wild and crazy but you know paul would do whatever we needed to do to try to make it work so um then this is also uh this is paul and carol but th we worked on this uh this um car here um for, i think this was when it was called willie because it was also a pre-production car that they made a car for her but anyway um it had a, a transmission that was 
always problematic. See, here's what I thought sports car racing would be like adjusting tire pressures, you know, but yeah, even with this, we were constantly messing with the transmission, trying to get it to work. But um, this was an interesting car. I, I, I joined, just did a couple weekends with them, but constantly messing with the transmission because it had this uh, transmission from um, an Aston Martin. And um, so it was a T56, but it was robotically shifted. And problem was trying to get it to work um, because Carol, because Carol was paralyzed, she couldn't use her legs. So she had to use hand controls to drive this thing. And so that's why it was automatic, uh, automated manual transmission. Um, and so the problem was all the instructions were in Italian because it was a, a Magneti Morelli, I think, system. So everything was in Italian. Making adjustments, never could figure it out. It turns out one of the problems we had was just that the shifter mechanism itself came loose from the top of the shifter um, on the tail shaft. But we'd never you know, only figured that out later. But always tweaking with this thing. And it was all in Italian. So that was kind of a funny story. Oh, here's another one. So Paul had a great relationship with uh, Vortec, you know, and he always... Uh, was super loyal to Vortex. So anyway, but the point is we had a Vortex on this car and it sucked a bolt in or something like that. I can't remember what it was, but something nicked the impellers. And so here we are at Laguna. And he's like, uh, well, what do we do here? I guess we just need to, uh, you know, file these impellers and file the nicks off the impeller. So here we are filing on a supercharger impeller. I wouldn't recommend this, but um, yeah, it was just something you just do what you got to do. I'm like, I got to get a picture of this. He says, well, I don't know if you want to take a picture. I said, I'm taking a picture. I don't care. <laughs> so there we are. That's with the Vortec. One thing I did learn, um, really interesting uh, in general on supercharger belts. So um, had a problem on this car where the belt was slipping all the time. No matter how tight we made the belt, it would slip. Um, and because what would happen is it was a fixed tensioner. So you'll notice on every car that has a serpentine belt, the tensioners are spring loaded. And there's a reason for that. Um, what would happen here is that um, a fixed tensioner, and even Vortex still does fix tensioners on a lot of things. And I'm like, eh, for high boost, that's just not going to work. The point is we had the belt super tight. Well, when it was super tight, it would heat up. When it would heat, it would slip. It would slip. And when it would slip, it would heat up. When it would heat up, it would expand and slip more. So it just was a vicious cycle. Once you figured out um, you know, a, a spring-loaded tensioner situation, the belt was so loose, you could just grab it with your hand. And you could move it around and the tensioner would spring there, but it would never slip. It made the boost all the time because the spring loaded tensioner kept the right tension on the belt and it wouldn't slip and it wouldn't overheat. And it wasn't so tight that it was overheating right off the bat. So always, 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 if you can, make sure that your supercharger system has a spring loaded tensioner somewhere in the blower belt system if you're running a lot of boost. Um, you know, the street stuff that Vortec does, probably they get by with, you know, just a street tensioner, no problem. But on a racing application where boost is important, especially road racing with heat soak and everything else shifts. Uh, and when the engine shifts too, the belt is going to slip because the engine's going to move a lot faster than the belt. Um, so, uh, or then the supercharger has a supercharger has a lot of inertia. So it, the belt is going to slip when it shifts. Um, so you just don't want all this tension in the belt so that it's really, you know, overheating. So that was an interesting thing we learned. Yeah. Typical. Uh, power steering uh, spilled on the exhaust. Yeah, I think this is most poor or something like that. That happened with Carol too. She was not, she was not uh, excited about this. She's like, "Why is this? Why is this burning?" Anyway, so that was a uh, always an adventure. Always was an adventure. So, and I just want to end this last thing. So this is uh, Road America. Um, this is how I proposed to my wife. So that was a. Uh, this is 1999. Also in that uh, maroon Mustang, you could see him not taking the proper line because I'm trying to go slow enough to point out the sign that she failed to see. And I'm like, look over there. She's like, what? Texaco? I'm like, no, over to the right. And she's like, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm like, it was, it was take, I was like, I was just crawling through there. I'm like, uh, can you see this? Yet? She's like, what, what? I'm like, the sign. Like, what sign? The one over there. Oh, anyway. So. Oh, that, that's yeah. a great way to propose. Sounds like it was yeah. better in your head than it was in reality yeah it was it, it, it was it worked out fine but um and that, that bridge is no longer there now they um they have a tunnel there uh but yeah that so anyway that's that was kind of fun road america is one of our favorite tracks so let me mm -hmm. bring us all back here so here we go so uh wes that was just excellent presentation and great stories and i think everybody enjoyed that so just i just can't thank you enough for joining us sure. and if you guys would like more um guests like this just uh, let us know who you'd like to have uh, us have on our show and we'll invite them on so we look forward to uh, our next adventure with Wes 
So Wes is going to be doing a little bit more work with us. So we're, we're excited about that as well. Um, Brad, do you have any last minute points you want to say? Uh, no, I don't think so. We had somebody that commented that um, they thought that the photo that Wes showed was from the Shelby Club event, maybe. It is correct. Yeah. That yeah, that, that would have been they they used to run it in September. Um, so that would have been September, mid mid September sometime. Um, yeah, and that it actually kind of worked out well. Um, weather wise, it's usually kind of iffy there because it could rain a lot. But um, yeah, that was always a highlight of my. Um, oh, actually, yeah, things things I learned. So um, I I just used whatever I could find to make that car work, um, and it was. I didn't really know a lot of what I was doing, but uh, for example, brake ducts, I used dryer ducting, like the silver dry stuff you use for your dryer. Cause that's the only stuff I could find. It was in the hardware store. I'm like, well, this looks like what I need. So I do that. Cause I, at the time, you know, the internet really wasn't a thing at the time. It was a thing, but it wasn't like I knew where I should search for, for race car parts. Right. I didn't know what race cars even used. Like the, I didn't know that they used silicone brake hose stuff. I didn't even know where to find that stuff. I would take, um, I would make panels for the um, for the car, like for brake ducts and stuff. I'd use I go to the hardware store and buy plexiglass and then heat it up with a with a torch and then melt it so that it would bend in the right place and then use that for my inlet for my brake duct thing. I mean, crazy stuff I do it like uh, to make to move my air cleaner up. I wanted to move. I, I didn't have the money or didn't want to buy a, a thicker air cleaner. So what I did was I just found found in the garage there was a snowmobile belt. That was the right diameter. So I put the snowmobile belt in the air cleaner housing, put the filter up higher on the air clean on the snowmobile belt. It was like, really? I mean, nowadays I just cringe at that stuff because it was just, uh, it was embarrassing because that's, but that's all I, I didn't know how to do it the right way. I didn't know that there was a different way to do it. Never been around any race cars at the time. Never looked at any professionally prepared race cars. Never knew any of that stuff. Um, actually, if there's one book series to really read, it's, um, the carol smith books especially the one on uh nut i think it's a book nuts and fasteners and if you need to read that book because it is phenomenally uh informative i learned a ton from that book like what lock washers do and what lock nuts do and why you would want to use these lock nuts versus those lock nuts and what you know how to make how to drill a proper hole and clearance the hole right for the bolt and all this stuff really, really informative. That to me, those the Carol Smith books were um, an eye-opening uh, experience, especially the the nuts and fast. I think it's called nuts, bolts, and fasteners or something. Sounds boring, mm -hmm. but it's really good. It's really good. Yeah, uh, Kenny, I really uh, love the Carol um, Smith. That's books right. As well, and actually, right. uh, in the Speed Therapy Academy, one of our master classes, we invite an industry expert on um, fasteners. So, and that he, it's just a really good class. You think, you, you, like you said, you'd think it's boring, but it's fascinating, fascinating. So, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously I, 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 I didn't get a chance to say it too, but obviously, I mean, I, we really all, and I miss Kenny a lot. I mean, he was really, um, he, he loved sharing his knowledge. And to me, that's, um, that can't be overstated. I mean, uh, he just loved to share what he learned and he was always learning to me. I appreciate that, uh, more than anything as far as, cause a lot of people like to kind of keep things close to the vest. It's like, no, what's the point? I mean, we all learn together. Um, so, and we all make mistakes and it's good to learn from those mistakes. So I, yeah, I really, I really miss, I really miss him, but I really miss that especially. Um, but I mean, kind of share that passion too so that's why i wanted to come on too and talk about sharing what we learn you know we learn stuff and there's a lot of times you don't being kind of self like from a mechanic standpoint i just nobody i just don't learn by doing it you know um so and making mistakes and being like oh that didn't work maybe we should do it differently next time or why did it fail that's another thing too if a part fails pay attention to pay attention to what was going on when it failed and then look at it in detail and be like, why did this crack here? Was there, where well, there's a reason, things happen for a reason. So you need to look and figure out why, why it happened. Um, there are no such things as just freak accidents. It, it probably, it, I mean, it probably happened. It was probably happening a while before it happens. So like if something apart breaks, it was breaking for a while, but you got to find out why it was breaking for a while. Anyway. And, and that's a reason why Kenny always, uh, you know, one of his big things is before you go on track, 
Um, and even if you're a, it's a street car, you need to maintain your car. You need to check those nuts and bolts. You need to look at everything before you're going on track. That's such an important part of, uh, you know, having a, a great weekend or a great, fun time. So, yeah, you're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, and don't, uh, I also learned to don't put your toolbox in front of your car when you're parked in the paddock. Because when you get in your car, you don't see it. Now, I've run over my own toolbox twice. <laughs> twice. I know it's there. I see it there. But I get in the car and I run over it because I'm like, there's nothing in front of me. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah. I mean, another thing, too, actually, um, really important that I have learned, too, is don't put bolts in and leave them loose. If you put a bolt in, torque it finish tightening it. Because if you leave this loose and leave that loose, you're going to forget. Same thing with the hood. If you have hood pins, don't put the hood down without putting the pins in. Every time, if you have hood pins on it, put the hood down, put the pins in. Even if it's going to be for 10 minutes, if the hood is down, the pins should be in. If the hood is, is up, fine, leave it up. But when you put it down, put the pins in. Race weekends all the time, you'll see people with their hoods flown up, probably because they forgot to put the pins in and they didn't, they didn't pay attention. So um, I always tell my kids, life skills, be a dad. Do dad stuff. Dad stuff is like, I need to take my wallet. So I'm going to put my wallet on top of my keys so that I can't leave the house without my wallet because the keys are under my wallet. And I'll still forget. But the point is, make uh, there's, like in safety, we learned there's engineered solutions and then there's administrative solutions. You can tell somebody, don't stick your hand in there, or you can make a guard so that their hand can't fit in there. You want to do the things that are foolproof. Telling people to do something or saying, well, I'll just remember to do that later. No, you won't remember you won't remember so don't trust it so just like the bolts and everything else just don't trust it don't leave it for chance anyway talked all enough sorry <laughs> well thank you I, I think you talked without taking a sip of water too that's that's impressive so you have your water there oh the coffee it's coffee <laughs> that's yeah. why okay. well thank you Great. very thank much you. yeah thank you very much wes and if you want to purchase wes's book um Go to the KennyBrown.com website for the discount. The discount code is CNC. Here, let's put Wes up. I'm going to put you up again, Wes. You can show that book. Um, so the discount code is CNC book. In other words, Cars and Coffee book. And uh, you'll get it for $29.95. But the most important part, again, is Wes will autograph it. Um, so make sure you get that. And uh, we really enjoyed you guys sticking it out with us. Of course, you enjoyed it because you're still here. Um, Wes, you're a wonderful guest, and we appreciate it, and we'll have you back again sometime. And thank you for the kind words about Kenny. It, it means means the world to me. So yes. um, he is missed. So thank, thank you, guys, and we'll see you next in two weeks. Uh, I think it's June 31st. Next week we'll have a, a Kenny Brown Encore presentation, and then uh, we will be uh, sharing who our next guest is in the next week or so. So take care. Have a great Father's Day. Take care. Bye-bye. All right.